Um, good to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning as we uh, are moving towards Resurrection Sunday, also known as Easter. Um, we're going to reflect on our King today, so if you want to open up me, uh, well, f- first we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14, our introductory scripture. We will be going to John 18 after that, but first we're going to read in 1 Corinthians 15, and that's to kind of hammer out a designation here between two kingdoms. So 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14 is where we'll be in just a second, and I, I reflect on in historically what was going on this week. Now next Sunday is Palm Sunday, unless I'm mistaken. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, right? All right. Uh, so... Jesus will be entering into Jerusalem. So what is he doing now? I mean, if we were to throw ourselves back there a couple thousand years, in the week prior to his week going into Jerusalem, what is he doing? And Scripture shows us that during this time, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. During this time. And the people that witness Jesus conquering death are going to follow him, many of them are, to Jerusalem. And they will be the ones on Palm Sunday singing his praises. They'll be the ones worshiping, most of them, because they've seen his sovereignty over death. And I can't help but put that mirror image up against the new Jerusalem. And what a mockery Jesus' triumphal entry into the earthly Jerusalem is compared to his triumphal marriage to the bride, which is the new Jerusalem, which will come down out of heaven. The last thing Jesus does in his earthly ministry before entering into Jerusalem to songs of praise from allegedly his people is he raises the dead, Lazarus. In the end time, the last thing Jesus does before entering into the new Jerusalem is to raise from the dead every believer. There's a nice little juxtaposition there. He's going to raise every believer. We will receive new bodies, glorified minds, glorified bodies, and we will enter into that new Jerusalem with Him. And that's what this alludes to that we're going to see in John in the next two weeks. It's a a pale image of what's to come. It's a corrupt image of what's to come. In the first century, when Jesus is moving into uh, Jerusalem, every voice that sings His praises, it's not honest worship for most of them. For most of them, it's just reflexive singing of Psalm 118, which we talked about last week. It's reflexive, or they seen him do so, they, they seen him, that's great English, they had seen him do some really cool stuff, so they were hoping to see him do more really cool stuff, so they were following him around to see the next, the next cool thing that he would do, that's not worship, that's not worship, Jesus isn't put here for our amusement, <laughs> Jesus He's here for our salvation, so they, even their worship is a mockery. But when the new Jerusalem comes down, everyone will truly worship. We will all worship from our hearts, and we will worship in ways that we're not even designed to worship now. There will be so, no sin nature. We won't have a sin nature. Can you imagine not having a sin nature? Not having that creeping little thought that jumps in there that shouldn't be there. I'm sure I'm not the only human being that has that, right? You're, you're, even in church, you're, you're, you're listening to the message, you're singing the song, whatever it is, and that little thought zip, just zips in there, and it's not worshipful, it's whatever. It's worldly. None of that will happen. Pure worship. Complete adoration for our King, Jesus Christ. Complete adoration without a semblance of regret, without a semblance of doubt, without a semblance of, I wonder what else is going on in the universe. Nothing. Pure worship. Our bodies and minds aren't even designed to do that now. We are corrupt. We are, 
living in a fallen world and in fallen bodies. And this, we're, there are two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of the flesh, and there is the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of the Spirit right now. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. But I want to read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 through the first half of 27, just to kind of set the stage for these two kingdoms. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he writes, And if Christ has not been raised, then your preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that He raised Christ whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, on earth in this kingdom, parenthetically I put those words there, we are of all people most to be pitied. But if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Here's the two kingdoms, the kingdom, of Ad, the kingdom of Adam and the kingdom of Christ. Don't miss it. For as by a, a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, the old kingdom, the kingdom we were born into, so also in Christ shall be made alive. That's the new kingdom, the kingdom we're born again into. Amen? But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Right? He got his resurrected body before we have. Amen? If this is my resurrected body, I am grossly disappointed. Verse 23. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Everyone who's born again will receive a new body. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power in this kingdom. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Two kingdoms. Two kingdoms. And as we reflect on these scriptures today, which kingdom are you a citizen of? Is the question. To which kingdom do you belong? It's a time for reflection, and it's a time for worship. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare. Father God, we love You. We are grateful for this time in Your house amongst Your people. But statistics really do say that not even everyone within these four walls are Your people. That there are some who don't know You, there are some who don't genuinely follow You as Lord and Savior, who have not thrown themselves on Your mercy, who have not confessed Your Lordship, who have not realized that they are but sinners in desperate need of a Savior, and You are the only Savior, as we read last week in Isaiah. There is no Savior besides You, Lord Jesus. And I pray to today, pray today that everyone under the sound of my voice who is not of your kingdom and not born again and not redeemed and not saved, and if they died right now would die in their sins, I pray that they would repent and come to you in faith and be saved. For the little children whose precious voices ring out so often in our worship services, who don't yet have the capacity to choose you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will spare them and I pray that you will set them apart for salvation and I pray that as soon as they are able, to recognize you, that you bring the truth of the gospel home to their hearts. I pray that every child in this fellowship will be saved and born again and walk in the newness of life. We aren't here to improve life in this kingdom. We are here to grab hold of life in your kingdom. And I pray that you will accomplish that through the proclamation of your word today, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn over, if you will, with me to John chapter 18, starting in verse 28. John chapter 18, the Gospel of John 18, and verse 28. Two kingdoms. The kingdom of Adam and the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of earth and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of death and the kingdom of life. Two kingdoms. 
coexisting in two planes now. Both kingdoms exist in the spiritual realm and both kingdoms exist in the physical realm. Two kingdoms. The title of today's message is Jesus the King. It could have easily have been a tale of two kingdoms. In our kingdom, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, our King humbled Himself and died to sin to save us. No other kingdom has a king like that. Satan's not dying to save anyone. Men cannot die to save men's eternal souls. Our king knew what he had to do. He loved us. He wanted to save us. And he knew the only way to do that was to hang himself on that tree and be the curse for us. So that we might receive his righteousness. and He might receive our punishment. What a king. What a king. Read me John chapter 18, verse 28 through 31, as we see this king of kings and lord of lords at the hands of false kings and sinners. And they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them, and he said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Worst case ever. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves then and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. The Jews telegraphed their punch. They, they, they didn't even hide what they were after. They said, we would try him in our own Sanhedrin, except we can't, by law, give it the death penalty. We, right there, they just tell Pilate what they want. We want this man dead. We can't do it. You've prohibited us from killing people in the name of our God because they had. It was no longer legal for the Jews to execute their own. It was. Formerly, it no longer was. The Romans had told them you can't just do that. There was one reason that they could do that. If someone walked into the Holy of Holies and profaned the temple, they were allowed to exact a a judgment of death, and that was the only way. And they still had to do it with government approval. And the only way that they could kill someone was by stoning them to death. They could not crucify the Jews. They wanted Jesus publicly humiliated and crucified. That's what they were after from the beginning. They don't even pretend that's not what they're after. We see that early in the morning, they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's. It was early in the morning. It's probably about 6 a.m. They were usually done by noon. The the Roman authority would come out and he would hear cases against people starting about 6 a.m. because no one wanted to stand in the heat of the day at noon, so they had to get all of the good government business over by the heat of the day, so they would start it early. And when it says early, it means early. It's probably about 6 in the morning, and they're standing out there. And the ones with the most influence got to be heard first. So the Sanhedrin brings this charge against Christ. They're the first to be heard early on in the morning. They are asking for the death of this man. What's his charge? We don't know. He's just doing evil stuff. Can you please kill him for us? They needed a capital offense. They needed a charge that was a capital offense that under Roman law, the person who did that offense would die. The one that they came up with was treason because Jesus had claimed his kingship. And they knew anyone that raised himself up as a king except Caesar was guilty of treason. So that was their charge. We see that they didn't want to dirty themselves. <laughs> Such hypocrisy. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. To come into contact with a Gentile defiled you. To go into the residence or the abode of a Gentile made you ceremonially unclean so they couldn't even 
come near. In their religion, they couldn't come near to Pilate. It would make them ceremonially unclean. They wanted to be ceremonially ceremonially clean so they could eat the Passover lamb. And they are standing there with the Passover lamb in chains, begging for his death. The hypocrisy. When we read, I don't know, last week, a couple weeks ago, in, in Philippians 2, that he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here is the king of the universe. The one who had knitted together every one of his accusers in the womb and brought them to a live birth, had guided them and watched over them in their upbringing and their being raised by their parents and threw into the military and into places of prominence in the Roman government, into places of prominence in the, in, in, in the synagogue, Christ had guided all of their lives and now they stand with Him in their midst and beg for His death. The hypocrisy. The arrogance. The profanity of this moment. The profanity of it. It's profane. It's profane. The God they claim to worship is standing in front of them and they are calling for His death at the hands of sinful men. It is a curse. It is a profanity. It is vile. It should make you want to take a shower to wash it off. It is dirty. And the King of Kings, God Himself, stands silent before His accusers because He knows. I love these people so much. I am willing to go through this for them. They want to eat the Passover lamb, so they're going to kill the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. They're going to eat Christ as the fulfillment of that Passover lamb, and they want to kill him. And I want to juxtapose the work of the lamb against the Passover. So if you'll turn back with me to Exodus 11.1. I want you to see, Exodus 11.1, I want you to see what Christ is accomplishing. The physical things in the Old Testament represent spiritual truths in the age in which we live. That's why all this stuff's in the Bible. Everything in the Bible in the Old Testament, physical, points to a spiritual truth in the new kingdom. All of it's there for that. These pastors that say we need to unhitch the Old Testament from the new. Jesus didn't unhitch the Old Testament from the new. Half of what he said was quoting the Old Testament. Even when he was dying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's in the Psalms. He even complained using the Word of God in the Old Testament. He even bemoaned his position. To unhitch the Old Testament from the New is the acme of foolishness. And it it takes out of context everything that Christ has done. So read with me uh, Exodus 11. Hopefully during my rant you have found Exodus 11.1. 1. So you can, I did that rant for your benefit. Okay, here we go. Exodus 11.1. 1. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Now the Exodus out of Egypt represents God bringing us out of our sin. That's what it represents. Let's go down to verses 4-7. through So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight, I, God will, God said this, About midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel. Either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Amen. God makes a distinction between His people and the people of the other kingdom. There's a distinction. Jesus talked about it all the time. Let's turn the page, whatever you got to do to get to uh, Exodus 12.1. As we continue just to explain the Passover and see it in context. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron 
in the land of Egypt. This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. All right, let's go down to verse 7. Then they shall take some of the blood of the lamb and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Let's go to verse 11. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, and your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste, and it is the Lord's Passover. Why? Because it's time to go. It's time to leave. It's time to get out of Dodge. When we receive Christ, it's time to go. It's time to leave our sin nature. It's time to leave condemnation. It's time to go. We don't want to dilly-dally and hang out in our sin nature. We want to be delivered right now. Amen. In the name of Jesus, I'm saved. I am, no, I am gone. Amen? I'm gone. <laughs> In haste, for I will pass through, verse 12, through the land of Egypt that night, and I, God, will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood of the Passover lamb, when I see the blood of the sacrificial lamb, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Praise God. Verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. Verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when He sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Amen. Turn where you need to turn to go to verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. Look there at the kindness of God. What did Paul say? Not everyone is Israel who is born Israel. Amen? No foreigner shall eat of it. In other words, someone who's not circumcised, someone who's not under the covenant won't eat it. But every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. So everyone who professes to follow Yahweh and enters into the godly assembly through circumcision and a profession of faith is able to eat it whether they were born Israelites or not. There's, God makes no distinction between the sojourner and the Israelite. All He makes a distinction between are those who worship Yahweh and those who do not worship Yahweh. That's the distinction. Race ain't got nothing to do with it. You either worship Yahweh or you don't. If you worship Yahweh, you're in His kingdom. If you don't worship Yahweh, you're not in His kingdom and you are open to judgment and death. Verse 46, it shall be eaten in one house, and you shall not take any of the flesh outside of the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Remember, Jesus was, his bones were not broken on the cross. All of the congregation shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, then he may come near and keep it. He shall be, listen, as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. Amen. One law. One covenant of peace. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He saves the faithful. He condemns those who bring it on themselves by refusing to worship Him. It's a beautiful picture. Go back to John 11. Now, if we're going to be in John 11 here in just a second. John eleven forty seven. 47, if you want to turn back to John eleven forty seven 47 and get ahead of the game and meet me there, please do. John 11 and 47. In this picture of God's sovereignty, 
that we're getting ready to read, the king has decreed this and it's going to happen. The very so-called high priest that year, Caiaphas, who turned Jesus over to Pilate, after Lazarus' resurrection, had selfishly but prophetically called for Jesus' death after Lazarus' resurrection. So let's take a look. John chapter 11 and verse 47 through 53. Now Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and the same high priest who just turned Jesus over to Pilate is meeting with the people. So the chief priest, verse 47, So the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered at the council and said, What are we to do for this man performs many signs? He just raised the dead, right? Verse 48, If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. In other words, if everyone follows Jesus as king, if we raise up another king amongst ourselves, the Romans will come and destroy us. There can be no king but Caesar. If everyone runs after this guy as king, the Romans will come and destroy the Jewish nation. The Pharisees had legitimate concerns. And we always make them the bad guy in the black hats. But the fact of the matter is, is they didn't believe that Jesus was Messiah, so they were doing everything that they could do to protect the Jewish nation. They thought their motives were pure. They simply didn't recognize who Jesus was. Okay? They're trying to save the nation. Here comes this wild card, this cowboy out of Nazareth who's doing all these crazy things. And not only is he talking the talk like all the other rabble-rousers have done, but somehow this guy's able to walk on water, raise the dead, heal the sick, feed the hungry. He's got all the power with him. What are we going to do? The thought never dawned on them that he might actually be the fulfillment of every scripture they ever read in the temple every Sabbath. They never thought to look there. The demons knew it. The sinners knew it. But the people trained to know it, didn't know. So they're concerned. Verse 49, But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, you guys. Nor do you understand. He's thinking pragmatically and he's thinking physically here. Not spiritually, but God's in control. So, Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people. In other words, we need to kill this Jesus guy. Not that the whole nation should perish. Listen to the messianic truth of this that Caiaphas is saying, but escapes him. Verse 50, one more time. Nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. That's Jesus, amen? Christ died for His people. If Christ hadn't died for us, His whole nation would perish. Verse 51, He did not say this of His own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, so that from that day on they made plans to put him to death. All right? Not only is Caiaphas prophesying that Jesus needs to die to keep the Jewish state, but he's prophesying in the Holy Spirit's prophesying through this guy that Jesus will die for the Jewish nation, but not only them, for the Gentiles also. In fulfillment of Scripture. There is a light of the Gentiles, Scripture says. You will walk the shores of Galilee, Scripture says. Jesus Christ came to save the Jewish people who would believe, but He also came to save the Gentile people who would believe. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? There's one law for the Jew and one law for the Gentile. One law, that law is Christ. Faith in Christ saves you. One law for every people. Whether you believe the law or not doesn't make a hair's difference. The law is the law. Paul, who was a specialist in Jewish law, points this out in his letter to the Corinthians, Corinthian church. If anyone would have clung to the old law and the old covenant, it should have been Paul, but he doesn't. Cleanse out the old leaven. He's going he's to marry this up to the Passover. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Right, that's bread as you really are unleavened, because Christ has forgiven of your, your sins. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, not because of religion, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Christ is our Passover lamb. When the angel of death comes, and he will, when Christ returns in glory, 
and he separates the sheep from the goats. The goats will go to judgment. The sheep will go into eternal life. He will make a distinction. What's he looking for to make that separation? He's looking for the blood of the Lamb on your heart. He will see the blood of Christ on you. He puts you in the sheep side. He doesn't see the blood of the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, covering your heart. He puts you on the goat side to be destroyed. When the destroyer comes, if you aren't covered by the blood of Jesus Christ through faith in Jesus Christ, you will be destroyed. That's the law. And God's a law keeper. God's a law keeper. And we tap dance through, not us here, we tap dance through through the Easter message. Man, they only come to church twice a year, just Easter and Christmas. We've got to have a nice, fuzzy, feel-good message for them when they come here so that they might come back more during the year. If you cater to the flesh, you will sow death. If we become so entertaining as to draw in a sinful world by our entertainment, we'll have to become more and more and more entertaining to keep them here. But if we preach the Gospel of Jesus Christ... The sheep will hear His voice and the sheep will come. And then all we have to do is keep preaching the Gospel. And God's people will keep a coming and keep a coming and keep a coming and keep a coming. And the chaff will be removed from the wheat and the tares will be removed from the wheat because the tares and the chaff ain't going to hang around to hear about Jesus when they want their flesh tickled. They're going to go out into the world. Find a skinny jean gel-haired pastor who will tell them how great they are. i got to confess a sin envy over guys that can wear skinny jeans and put gel in their hair. i got to confess. If I wore skinny jeans, it would be a blast for me. And uh, I, don't really, I don't really have the hair to gel unless you want to see it sticking out the side like Bozo. I don't know. But it's not that they wear skinny jeans and have gel in their hair. That's not the problem. It's not the problem that they're good speakers and they're entertaining. That's not the problem. And and the problem isn't that they play cool music with drums and guitars. and That's not the problem. The problem is Jesus is not at the center of the gospel they preach. That's the problem. If you find a skinny jean gel-haired guy that preaches the gospel, stay in that church. Stay in that church. Amen. It's all about the message. It's not about the messenger. Some of you have seen my brother and my dear friend Gary Harner preach at this church. He can't make it up the stairs now. He sits in a wheelchair as he preaches. But he loves Christ and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit moves when he speaks because he speaks the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you find him too boring, that's on you. Because you're not hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't hear the words of Christ because you're hearing the words of your Father, Jesus said. Don't listen to the messenger. Don't even look at the messenger. Just hide your eyes from the messenger and listen to the message. All right, let's go back to John chapter 18. It's important to remember here. John chapter 18 and verse 29. If you're church hunting... Find a church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ without apology. Uh, If you can also find a church that preaches the gospel, that plays the kind of music you like, and has the kind of ministers you like, fine, that's a perfect fix. Praise God. He led you to the church you need to be in. That's great. But if the gospel's not there, don't go there. All right. But as we continue here in verse 29, it's important to remember it was the Roman officials' jobs to do whatever they could to keep the peace (laughs) and to keep the Jewish masses under control. So Pilate's going to do whatever he can to keep the peace. Off with his head if he doesn't keep the peace. I mean, it's serious. But let's look at John 18, verses 29 through 36. John 18, 29 through 36. And as we look at this, I want you to see the distinction between the two kingdoms. Let me read. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Verse 33, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus privately now and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
Man, what a question. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? And that's something important to hang on to. A lot of people profess that Jesus is Lord because other people have told them that Jesus is Lord. And it's not a matter of their personal confession. It's just what they've heard in church their whole life. And when the sun comes out and scorches the earth, when times get hard, they fall away. Not because they have faith and lost it, but because they never had faith. They just heard it and didn't have anything else to say. It's unpopular to be in the church and say, Jesus isn't Lord, or I'm unsure that Jesus is Lord. It's unpopular, and it takes boldness actually to say that. I wish more people who thought that would say that in church. We want to know if you have questions about who Jesus is, so we can minister to you, so that we can give you all the evidence, so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to follow Christ. But if all you got is Jesus is Lord, because you, it, you have to have a childlike faith and you just have to believe it. It's faith, not works, and it's just, you, you, it's just a matter of faith. You just have to believe that. If that's all you got, I, I, I don't know if you have faith. Do you say this of your own accord, or did others tell you to say it about me? Verse 35, Pilate answers, am I a Jew? Who are you talking to, dude? That's what he said. Am I a Jew? Why are you putting this question to me? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Here it is. Jesus answers, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. My sheep hear my voice. Do you see it there? My sheep hear my voice. They won't go to another. They don't know his voice. They will come to me. So what is the church doing preaching anything other than Jesus' voice? Why do pastors get in pulpits week after week and preach everything except this book? Why? Lost people are listening for the voice of their shepherd. If you never give it to them, they will never hear it. We preach the voice of God when we preach the Scriptures that God wrote. 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? What is truth? I went, I went too far. I wasn't supposed to read that far. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's so funny. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And later on, he's going to write it word for word and hang it right over Jesus' head. Behold the king of the Jews. He knows the truth. He just doesn't want to believe the truth. So the nature of, let's look at a couple things. We're going to look at two, two aspects of Christ's kingdom. The nature of it and the nature of its citizens. Okay, So the nature of Christ's kingdom and the nature of Christ's kingdom citizens. Let's look at verse 36 one more time. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Let's take a look. The nature of Christ's kingdom is that it's spiritual. For now. The nature of Christ's kingdom is it's a spiritual kingdom for now. All right? Jesus isn't interested in the physical that the world has to offer, is he? Is he? Satan tempted him with it. Isn't that what Satan tempted him with? But Jesus didn't want it. Let's, let's take a look at Matthew 4, 8-10. Again, again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you will just fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. <laughs> Jesus wasn't playing. I'm telling you, he wasn't. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. You lay all these baubles out in front of me that ain't yours to give in the first place. Why do we always believe that Satan had the power to give that to Jesus? Why do we read that passage and say Satan could have given it to Jesus? Who says? He's the father of lies. He exaggerates his power when he speaks to you. Satan can't do anything Yahweh doesn't allow him to do. He can't freelance. He can't creep into your house and make you sin. 
He's not all powerful. He comes before God like now he comes before God like this. Now. Where have you been, devil? Oh, Rome in the earth, seeing what trouble I can cause. Remember that in Job? When Satan appeared before Yahweh, God whistles, Satan comes. Heal, boy. That, that's the relationship. And we give this guy all this credit. I don't want to profane principalities because Scripture says don't profane principalities. And I don't want to say we have uh, dominion over Satan because we don't. He is a prince. If you and I came face to face with Satan in our own strength, he would destroy us. We wouldn't have a chance. We wouldn't have a chance. You can't fight Satan. You can't bind Satan. You can't throw Satan into the abyss. Who do you think you are? But God can. I don't know who's binding Satan, but they seem to be letting him go an awful lot. If Satan is bound and can be bound just by my proclamation, hey, be bound, why does Peter say he roams around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour? And bind Satan? But God can. God can. So the nature of his kingdom is that it's spiritual. That's why God's kingdom can be in the midst of us. Because it's spiritual. That's why God's kingdom can be in every believer's heart in the person of the Holy Spirit because it's a spiritual kingdom. God's looking for worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen? Right? It, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual kingdom now. The spiritual kingdom now. But just like we Christians who are waiting, please, Lord Jesus, any minute would be good for our glorified bodies... Jesus' kingdom is waiting anxiously to take on physical form in the new heavens and the new earth. Let's take a look at uh, Romans 8, 21 to 25. will be up on the screen for you. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The creation will. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, both of us, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we want. We wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. It's coming, it just isn't here yet. It's accomplished, but it's not here yet. For in this hope we were saved, right? You were saved in the hope of that day. Amen. Who was saved in the hope of that day? Were you saved in the hope that you were receiving a heavenly kingdom? Is that your hope? Please tell me that's your hope. Is that somebody's hope? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was your hope. Please tell me, God, this isn't as good as it gets would be another way to say that. Amen? For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. If we had it now, it wouldn't be hope. We would just know we had it. For who hopes for what he sees? See how foolish that would be? Why? Hope somebody gives me some water. I already have the water. I don't have to hope for the water. I know I have the water. We hope for the kingdom because we don't have that physical kingdom yet, but we know it's coming. Amen? We know it's coming because God is faithful. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with patience, right? Knowing that that kingdom is coming gives us patience here on this earth. I can endure now because I am 100% confident that that kingdom's coming. Amen? I can put up with this for a little while. The pain that we endure now isn't even worthy of being compared to the glory that we'll see. I believe that with all my heart, right? So when I remember that in my times of trial, because I always don't, right? When I remember that spiritual truth about the spiritual kingdom, I can endure a lot more knowing there's good things just the other side of that door coming to me for sure than I can if I live on earth hoping I'll go to heaven. Wondering if I'll go to heaven. We hope for the things we're sure of. We hope for God's promises. Because we know, all right? So Christians live in joy and hope because what we're seeing is not our kingdom. This is not our permanent home. We are sojourners here, and we look forward to a better country along with the cloud of witnesses that we read about in Hebrews 11 and the beginning of Hebrews 12. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12. Has everyone read that? Who's the cloud of witnesses? Moses, Abraham, everyone listed in Hebrews 11 is this cloud of witnesses. Moses is standing with us going, yeah, I can't wait till the kingdom is manifest in the flesh. I can't wait. We're like, yeah, Moses, right on. But we can't see him, obviously, because it's spiritual. I don't want to 
Okay, we don't want to chase that down, but we're looking for a better company, uh, country, along with every worshiper of Yahweh from the beginning of the world until now. That is the cloud of witnesses. And we know that God's promises are true. The Israelites that perished in the wilderness were the ones that were convinced that God's promises were not true. Amen? Isn't that right? We're not going into the promised land. I know you've promised it to me. I know you've promised to conquer my enemies. I know you've promised to give me everything, but I see them, and they're really big, and they're really strong, and I don't believe that you can deliver me. I ain't going in there. And Jesus says, fine, die in the wilderness then if you don't believe me. The children who you say would be prayed to all these people, I'll take them in. You, you don't have faith, you don't get into the promised land. Uh-oh, another spiritual truth. If you don't place your faith in Christ, you don't get into the promised land. God doesn't change the game on us. It's always the same. So, Jesus' kingdom is spiritual for now. Second thing here about Jesus' people, God's people, is that we're spiritual warriors. Let's read verse 36 again. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. All right? Yes. In this world, we're supposed to turn the other cheek, aren't we? And be meek, aren't we? Yeah. Does that not sit right with anybody else? Do you ever think, wait a second. So, you mean to tell me if somebody breaks into my house seeking to do harm to my family, I got to say, oh yeah, go ahead. Has anyone else ever wrestled through that before? This whole turn the other cheek thing? It's nuanced, but the fact of the matter is, we turn the other cheek spiritually in those circumstances, but we're not being attacked for the kingdom of God in that instance. We're being attacked in the earthly kingdom. They're not attacking my Christianity. They're attacking my wife. So in this kingdom, if they attack me in this kingdom, I fight in this kingdom. But Jesus is saying right here, my, this isn't my kingdom. Christians can't use physical violence to defend the kingdom of God. We can't do it. It's off the table. But can we do it to protect what we have in this kingdom? Yeah, you better. That's good stewardship. I'm supposed to protect my wife. If you come up to attack my wife, you can punch in the eye. That's not sin. It's sin if you go down and then I move in for the kill. That's sin. I'm not trying to be funny. I, I'm just, I, I want you to see the distinction. We fight the point of attack. When we get attacked in the flesh, when you get attacked as being a Christian, you don't resist with physical violence because that kingdom's spiritual. But if I get attacked as a man, they're attacking me in this physical kingdom that I'm also a citizen of, and I'm going to defend what God's given me. I'm a steward of what God's given me. All of the Old Testament's about this. Did the people of Israel fight? Yes, because their promised land was of a physical kingdom. Why do you think God told them to do that then, but he doesn't tell us to go to war now? Because we're not fighting for it. Jesus just said it. My kingdom now is not of this world. Does that make sense? Work it through. Work it through. It's, it's worthy of contemplation. All right? Because Christians think we've got to be these welcome mats, these doormats that just let people walk all over. Well, in a spiritual realm, maybe I need to let people take advantage of me and turn the other cheek and give them my cloak if they ask for just my sandal. Maybe I need to do that spiritually. God's Word says that I do in order that I might be a testimony to them down the road and lead them to Jesus Christ. But the guy charging me with an axe in his hand is going to get a different response. Anyway, let's take a look. Christians are spiritual warriors. Let's look at the verses. God has given us armor. Amen? Now, God didn't ask his, his disciples to do violence here, but he gives us all this warrior stuff. Let's look. God gives us armor, Ephesians 6, 18 through 10, uh, 10 through 18. Look at the words he uses in Ephesians uh, 6, 12. We wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We wrestle. Why does he use that language? 
Can you wrestle and not fight? No. We fight the good warfare. God calls us to fight the good warfare. He's commanded us to fight the good warfare. First, I'm giving you the verses right up there. We're commanded to fight, but we don't fight according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10.4. Why? God's kingdom isn't of the flesh. God's kingdom is of the spirit. We fight spiritual warfare, not physical warfare for the kingdom of God. There, we can never march off to take Jerusalem in the name of Jesus Christ. That would be sin. Why? That's not God's kingdom. God's kingdom is spiritual. We advance on that. He's given us weapons of righteousness for our right hand and for our left, 2 Corinthians 6, 7. He calls us to contend for the faith. That's battle. Contend for the faith that was once for all passed down to the saints. So this is an awful lot of fighting language for a group of people that ain't supposed to ever fight nothing. But we pervert what God is telling us to do when we take up arms in the name of Jesus. We pervert what God is telling us to do when they come to arrest us for our faith and we fight them tooth and nail and don't just go like Jesus did. Because that's a spiritual battle for the spiritual kingdom. All right? Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare in the new kingdom are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments. So what are we fighting here? We're fighting spirituality and we're fighting ideas, right? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience is complete. That is a battle right there that we just described. We have the power to destroy strongholds. What strongholds? Spiritual strongholds. Those things that tempt you. Are you powerless over the things that tempt you? Not in Christ. We're free from sin in Christ. Amen? Now when I have a spiritual thing that's attacking me, my desire for this or my desire for that, I take that thought captive, right in keeping with what James says, that sin starts with a thought, and when we nurture that thought, then it manifests into something bigger. As soon as that sinful thought hits your mind, Grab it with Scripture and cast it to the ground. I want to watch that television show that has a bunch of risque, scantily clad women in it. The minute that thought comes into my mind, we need to grab the Word of God and say that's not how a citizen of God's kingdom walks. That's not what a citizen of God's kingdom does. Take it captive before you start cruising through with the remote. Grab it with the Word of God. When temptation hits you, you hit it back with the Word of God. We are not powerless against our sins. He hasn't tempted us beyond our ability to resist. Right? 1 Corinthians 10.13 But with every temptation, He's given us a way of escape. Every temptation comes with it. A way of escape. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Are we asking God to do all the work? Kind of, but we know that we're going to be in temptation. The prayer is, give me the foresight and the wisdom and the love for you to see the avenue of escape that you've given me and to take it instead of sinning. That's what the Lord's Prayer says. We are not powerless, and we are to go to spiritual war every day. Clothe yourself in the armor of God ingest the Word of God, which is your spiritual food, grab the sword of the Spirit, and march out into the world being Jesus Christ in the face of all the powers of darkness that are going to come against you. You fight at work. You fight in your home against the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places. Driving alone in your car with nothing but you and your thoughts. You are fighting a war against the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places. They are trying to encroach on you, drive you away from Christ, drive you into the flesh, and make you ineffective for the kingdom. And if you ain't got nothing in your toolbox to fight with, you're going to drive off the road every time. But if we're in the Word of God and we're in prayer and we're in fellowship with the saints which help us to grow in Christ, we get stronger and stronger and stronger as the fruit of the Spirit bears fruit in our lives and wells up 30, 60, and 100 fold. And we start to live in the abundance of the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, that thing that so easily derailed me yesterday ain't getting me today. 
constant battle, isn't it? Constant battle. But it's not physical violence. And that's what Jesus is saying here. My kingdom's not of this world. All right. I'm sweating. So our king stands before the rulers of this world who had only have authority because he gave it to them, right? And they dare to question him. And we're going to finish the sermon text here and then we're going to go. Um, but I want you to take two points away from what we're getting ready to read and, and, and go through here in our final minutes. First thing, God's people want Jesus as their king. God's people, they want Jesus as their king. Second thing, Satan's people do not want Jesus as their king. That's the two groups of people on the planet. Those who want Jesus as their king and those who don't want Jesus as their king. And we're going to see it played out here. No one suffers under God's righteous judgment because they didn't have enough information to be saved. No one. No one. Most of the world will suffer under God's righteous judgment because they hate Him so much that they don't want to be saved and be forced to worship Him for the rest of eternity. That's why. Kneeling before Christ for eternity would be hell for them because they don't love Him, they don't want Him, they don't need Him. It's a shame. All right, let's look at verse 37 of John 8, 18 real quickly. Then Pilate said to him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. You should reflect back on John 10 there. You know, my sheep hear my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release for you one man at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? You can almost hear the sarcasm in his voice. They cried out again, testifying against themselves and fulfilling every Old Testament prophecy about how God's people will turn their back on them. They cried out again, not this man, not Christ, not the Messiah, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. I'm always mystified by this, and I'm always amazed because I know me, and if I had the power to annihilate the universe and start over, this would have been a pivotal moment for me. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. The Jews had a rule. The penalty was 40 lashes, but they would only do 39. Right? They would back it off one and only do 30. And they only whipped you with a leather strap that, with just leather. That was what the Jews could do. But the Roman rules for this is they would beat you until the Roman beating you was so exhausted he couldn't do it anymore. Our king is no longer under the law of God's people. He's now under the law of the Gentiles who hate him. And it wasn't uncommon, as you read through the histories, it was not uncommon for bones to be exposed by the flogging. It wasn't uncommon for entrails to come out during the flogging. It wasn't uncommon at all. We don't, we don't want to gore you. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, mocking him, and struck him with their hands. Remember, Satan's people do not want Jesus as their Lord. They make fun of it. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Look, the sinful world can't find guilt in Christ. But that doesn't matter, does it? So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. I think he was trying to dissuade them. Say, look, I really gave him a good beating. Isn't that good enough for you? I really think that's what it was. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, have mercy on him? Save him? That is enough? Release him? No. No. Crucify him. Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. He knows they can't crucify him. He's like, look, this is stupid. That's really what Pilate's saying. Look, this is stupid. You want that done, go do it yourself. And what he's saying is, I have no basis to do this to this man. But then they scare him. The Jews answered him, 
We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. The Romans worshipped all types of gods. And in the back of Pilate's mind, he's thinking, what if this guy has some spiritual power that I don't know about? So he got a little bit jittery, not enough to repent, but... Verse 9, he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? How arrogant. Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Amen. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. I love it. I love that Jesus tells Pilate right there, you're sinning. Right? He said, the one that handed me to you has greater sin, but that implies you have sin too. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. He's feeling guilty. And he wasn't a nice guy. If you read the history, he wasn't a nice guy. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. And that's where it becomes trouble. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. They really want this guy dead. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement. And in the Aramaic, it's Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. It's about noon. Remember what I said? Noon. They want to get it over by noon, right? It's about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. Why did he say that? Why did he say, Behold your king? Weren't tensions running high enough? Now he's going to make fun of them? All of these people? Behold your king? Why, why, would, why would Pilate say that? I'm trying to de-escalate situations, and that ain't a way to de-escalate a situation. Behold your king? I don't think he had any other thing to say. I think the Holy Spirit moved in him to say exactly what was true. Because the people that killed Christ don't go unpunished. They cried out, a chance to repent, right? Behold your king. Is that not a chance to repent? And they cried out instead of, yeah, you're right, we're wrong. Take him down. They said, away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Again, I think that's the Holy Spirit. The chief priests answered to their own condemnation. Listen to this. The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Ain't that the truth? God wasn't their king. Caesar was their king. They were their own king. So he delivered them over to be crucified. This is a tough season in the church. We Love that Christ died for us, but now we have to watch Him go do it, and it's hard. But for those of you sitting out there that don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, He did all this for you. For you. Because He loves you. And He wants to have a relationship with you, a holy and pure relationship for the rest of eternity. He wants to celebrate the glories of God with you for the rest of eternity in heaven. He wants to deliver you from sin, forgive your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and establish you as children of God. That's what Christ wants for you. And all you have to do is confess Him as Lord and ask for forgiveness and you will be saved. Won't you do that?